Hello everyone, my name is Jason Labner and I'm an assistant professor in biology at Northern Arizona University. I was asked to give a presentation for the Festival of Science about the novel coronavirus that's causing the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see, I decided to title my talk, The Simple Fool's Guide to the Pandemic. I actually borrowed this title from my PhD advisor, Steve Palumbi. Back in the early 90s, Steve wrote the first version of the Simple Fool's Guide to the Polymerase Chain Reaction, which is a really fundamental process that has enabled almost all of what we do today in molecular biology. And in fact, PCR is the primary technique that's used to detect when people are infected with SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Well, the point of this guide was to distill the key principles underlying this foundational molecular biology reaction and to do so in a way that would be understandable for a complete novice in the topic. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about in this presentation, I thought that this is really what is needed. Clearly, there's no shortage of articles about the pandemic, both in the scientific and mainstream media but it can be hard to sort through all of the various pieces of information and determine which bits to actually trust. So my goal in this talk is not to try to teach you everything that's known about the pandemic, but to clearly explain a few of what I think are the key pieces of information that you need in order to better understand the pandemic and the virus that's causing this public health emergency. Here is an outline of the topics that I'll be covering today, and I've posed each of these topics as a question that I think many people have probably asked and are still asking about this pandemic. The first of these is, what is SARS coronavirus 2? And you can see here that I'm using a common abbreviation for coronavirus, COV. Next, from where did this virus come? How is the virus transmitted? How do tests for COVID-19 work? And finally, what does immunity look like? All right, so I want to start off today with just a little bit of background information about the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. And this virus is called SARS coronavirus 2. Here I'm showing an image of four SARS coronavirus 2 particles that was generated using an electron microscope. The virus particles are highlighted here in orange and the background is shown in blue, but these are really just artificial colors. The actual images produced by these instruments are just in black and white. Now this is just a two-dimensional image so these virus particles look like circles, but in three dimensions, these particles are roughly spherical in shape. And you can see this crown of proteins protruding from the surfaces of these particles. These proteins are actually the reason that this group of viruses were called coronaviruses, as corona in Latin means crown or garland. Now, I think that pretty much everyone is aware that this disease is caused by a virus, but I'm not sure that everyone has a clear idea of exactly what a virus is and how these pathogens differ, for example, from bacteria. Well, here is the definition of a virus that I use in my virology class. A virus is an infectious, obligate intracellular parasite comprising genetic material, surrounded by a protein coat and or a membrane. Now, this is clearly a very technical definition, but it encompasses several really important characteristics of viruses that I think it's important to understand. So I'm going to go ahead and take a couple minutes to step through uh, a few of the different components of this definition. One of the most important components is this phrase, obligate intracellular parasite, which means that viruses cannot reproduce outside of host cells. 
they are completely dependent upon resources present within those host cells in order to reproduce. And in part, this is because virus particles are not cells, and viruses do not have cells, which means that they cannot produce energy or any of the basic building blocks that are needed for the virus to reproduce. Instead, virus particles are simply composed of genetic material, which can be either DNA or RNA, and a protein coat or membrane. And this protein coat or membrane is what's used to protect the genetic material. And then the final important component um, of this definition is that viruses are infectious which simply means that they can be transmitted to new hosts. Here are a couple other views of coronavirus particles. The one shown here on the right is a cross-sectional diagram of a single virus particle. And here you can see the nucleic acid genome, which is shown in pink, as well as the surrounding membrane or envelope, which is shown here in red. Like many other viruses that infect humans, the SARS coronavirus 2 genome is protected by a membrane composed of lipids. And this is actually why it's possible to inactivate these viruses with simple hand soap, because the molecules of soap disrupt this protective lipid membrane and therefore destroy the virus particles. However, no viruses actually encode genes for generating these types of membranes. Instead, they simply steal these membranes from the cells that they infect. Therefore, these membranes that are used to construct SARS coronavirus 2 viral particles are actually our own cellular membranes, although with some modifications such as the incorporation of viral proteins. One example of those viral proteins is shown here in yellow. These yellow proteins are the virus's spike glycoproteins, and I'll talk about these in a bit more detail later because these proteins play a crucial role in mediating the entry of virus into our cells. And because they're pretty large and they cover the external surface of the virus particle, these proteins are one of the main targets of our own immune response. All right, the final characteristic of SARS coronavirus 2 that I want to convey is the size of the virus particles. Each viral particle is about 100 nanometers in diameter, which is about the same size as HIV particles, but larger than particles of rhinoviruses which are one of the pathogens that cause the common cold. As a point of comparison, all of the blue particles shown here represent the largest known viruses, all of which infect amoebas. On the far right, you can see a single cell of the E. coli bacterium. And here at the bottom is just a small part of a human red blood cell. Okay, so now you know a little about what SARS coronavirus 2 is, but from where did this virus come? Well, this virus is an example of something that we call an emerging virus, which is a virus that has only recently been recognized to cause infections or disease in humans. However, this virus didn't simply emerge out of thin air. Rather, this is a virus that was previously circulating within some type of non-human animal host, and then was transmitted to humans. And this is, in fact, the ultimate source of all emerging viruses in humans. Cross-species transmission events from other animals. And more often than not, from other animal species that are relatively closely related to us, and therefore, this usually means that these viruses are transmitted from other mammal species. Now, these types of cross-species transmission events, they're actually probably not all that uncommon. There are a lot of scenarios in which humans come into close contact with wildlife. However, most viruses that infect other animal species are not able to infect us. 
Or even if they can infect our cells, the infection will usually be a dead end because the virus is unable to transmit from human to human. However, in some rare cases, a virus may be pre-adapted to infect and spread among humans, or the virus may be able to adapt quite quickly to the new human host. And it's those cases that give rise to new emerging viruses and potentially to new pandemics, depending on just how efficiently the virus is able to spread among humans and whether there is any pre-existing immunity to this virus within the human population. Now, in terms of the direct animal source for SARS coronavirus 2, that we don't actually know at this point. However, we do know that this virus belongs to a group of viruses that primarily circulate within populations of horseshoe bats. And in fact, the closest known virus to SARS coronavirus 2 was obtained from a wild bat. Now, what I'm showing you here is called a phylogeny. You can also think of this as an evolutionary tree. And it contains both the original SARS coronavirus, which is shown here in blue, as well as SARS coronavirus 2, which is shown here in red. Along with all of the most closely related viruses that have been sampled from wildlife. And the vast majority of these have been sampled from various bat species. In fact, every one of these gray circles represents a virus that was sampled from a bat. What these data tell us is that SARS coronavirus 2 likely originated within a bat. However, we can't say for certain that the virus was transmitted directly from a bat to a human. It's possible that the virus was first transmitted to an intermediate host. So for example, civet cats were found to be important intermediate hosts in the original SARS coronavirus outbreak that occurred in 2002 and 2003 meaning that the virus was originally transmitted from bats to civet cats, and then from civet cats to humans. Now, the final thing that I want to mention here is the relationship between the original SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2. The new virus, SARS coronavirus 2, is quite similar to the original SARS coronavirus, and this is why the virus was given a very similar name. But from this analysis, it's clear that these two are still very distinct viruses. In fact, the authors were able to utilize the differences that they saw between the genomes of these two viruses to estimate how long ago these viruses actually shared a common ancestor. And it turns out that these two viruses probably diverged hundreds of years ago, perhaps as far back as the 12th or 13th centuries. And so for a little bit of context here, this means that these two viruses may have last shared a common ancestor at the time when Genghis Khan lived. Now that we've talked about what this virus is and from where it came, let's talk a little about how the virus is transmitted from person to person. Although SARS coronavirus 2 is capable of infecting several different tissues of the body, and COVID-19 is associated with a wide variety of symptoms, like the other coronaviruses that infect humans, SARS coronavirus 2 is primarily a respiratory virus, which means that it typically infects cells of the respiratory tract, and the virus is spread from person to person through saliva and nasal mucus. This spread can occur through direct contact with an infected individual, but it can also be spread through aerosols that are formed when an infected person sneezes or coughs, or even when they simply talk or sing. These virus-containing particles are then, can then be breathed in, for example, by somebody who's nearby, and this can result in infection of this new host. Now, one important thing to recognize is that not all of these respiratory droplets are created equal. Instead, droplets of many different sizes will be generated, as depicted in both of the images on this slide. The larger particles will settle to the ground relatively quickly 
while the smaller particles can remain airborne for extended periods of time and thus can travel long distances from the infected individual. Virus transmission mediated by these larger droplets is referred to as droplet transmission, whereas virus transmission through these smaller droplets is called airborne transmission. There has been quite a bit of debate regarding the role of airborne transmission um, for SARS coronavirus 2, but it's widely agreed that droplet transmission is very common, and in fact many of the common recommendations for preventing transmission are specifically aimed at preventing droplet transmission. This includes the social distancing guidance to stay at least six feet away from others. This should provide enough space for those larger droplets to settle to the ground. This also includes the recommendation to wear cloth masks, especially when recommended uh, social distancing guidelines cannot be followed. The image here on the right provides a really nice illustration of the benefits of wearing masks for preventing droplet transmission. And the primary benefit really comes from reducing the number of droplets that are spread by infected individuals. However, they can also help to reduce the number of droplets that are inhaled by an uninfected individual, especially for the larger droplets that are more likely to contain infectious virus particles. Another one of the main recommendations to avoid transmission of this virus is to regularly wash your hands and to avoid touching your eyes, mouth, or nose with unwashed hands. One important thing to understand about virus transmission is that a virus can only infect a person via the mucous membranes of the body or through some type of scratch or injury in the skin. This is because the skin provides a really effective protective barrier to infection. And the way that it does this is actually very simple. As you've likely heard before, the outermost layers of your skin are composed of dead cells. And viruses cannot infect or replicate within dead cells. Therefore, even if droplets containing infectious virus particles were to land on your hands, your arms, or even the skin of your face, these viruses would not be able to cause an infection. Similarly, if you were to touch a surface that contained infectious virus particles, this wouldn't be enough for the virus to infect you unless you actively transport those virus particles to one of your mucous membranes, such as your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. The other important aspect of transmission is timing. And in particular, the timing of transmission relative to the appearance of symptoms. This graphic illustrates two important epidemiological periods. The first is the incubation period, which is the period of time between when a host becomes infected and the appearance of symptoms of infection. During this period, the infected individual will likely have no idea that they're infected and yet the virus is actively reproducing within that individual's cells. The other important period is the infectious period, which is the period of time during which an individual is shedding virus that can be transmitted to others. Now in this figure, these two periods are illustrated as being mutually exclusive. And for some viruses, like Ebola virus for example, this is in fact the case. However, for SARS coronavirus 2, these two periods actually overlap. And this is really important because it means that it's possible to transmit the virus to others before you even know that you're sick. And with this virus, we also know that a large percentage of infected individuals will never actually experience any symptoms associated with that infection. But these people can still transmit the virus. And this is why it's so important for everyone to wear masks in public spaces, regardless of whether they've experienced symptoms of this disease. Now that we've discussed transmission, the next topic I want to cover is clinical tests for COVID-19. There has been a lot of talk about testing over the past several months. Testing capacity, percent positivity, lines to get tested, 
often long waits for results. But I'm not sure everyone really understands how these tests work and exactly what they tell us. There are actually two general categories of tests for COVID-19. One type detects active SARS coronavirus 2 infections, while the other detects evidence for past exposure to SARS coronavirus 2 by detecting an individual's immune response to infection. The first category has been the focus of most discussions of testing capacity and speed. And this is the type of test that's actually useful for helping to prevent the spread of the virus because it identifies people who are likely contagious. So let's talk about this category first. The most common type of test being run to detect active SARS coronavirus 2 infections is a molecular test. This type of test is run either on saliva or nasal or throat swabs. And this test is looking for evidence that the individual is actively shedding virus particles. However, these tests are not actually detecting virus particles or testing for infectivity. Rather, these tests look for the presence of the viral genome. And they do this using a procedure called the polymerase chain reaction, which is able to very specifically amplify small pieces of the virus's genome. The good thing about these tests is that they are very sensitive and very specific, and therefore they provide very accurate diagnosis of active infections. There are a variety of procedures out there for these types of tests, but generally these can not be run at your sort of local point of care facility like your doctor's office. These need to be sent to a specialized lab. And while most have the potential to be run within 24 hours, there's a backlog at many of these testing sites, which has been causing considerable delays. And this is a big problem because even if infected, the patient may no longer be contagious by the time that they actually receive their results. The second type of test being run to detect active SARS coronavirus 2 infections is called an antigen test. This type of test uses nasal or throat swabs and is also looking for evidence that the individual is actively shedding viral particles. But instead of detecting the genome of the virus, this test detects viral proteins, most commonly the spike envelope proteins on the surface of viral particles, which are shown here in yellow. One of the main benefits of this type of test is that they can be run very quickly, usually within less than an hour, and can often be run at your point of care facility. However, while a positive result from this type of test provides very strong evidence for an active infection, a negative result is not particularly meaningful because this type of test has a very high false positive rate. Therefore, people who receive negative tests results will need to then seek out a molecular test if they want to be confident in their result. That brings us to the second major category of tests, the tests that detect an immune response to SARS coronavirus 2, which indicates a history of infection. In this case, blood needs to be collected, either via a venous blood draw or a finger prick. And this test is detecting antibodies that recognize and bind to viral proteins. These antibodies are products of our adaptive immune response and therefore an indication of past infection with SARS coronavirus 2. However, it takes some time for this adaptive immune response to be generated, and therefore these tests are unlikely to be able to detect active virus infections. Instead, these tests are primarily used to inform public health organizations about the percent of the population that has already been infected, and therefore may be immune to reinfection. And that is actually a nice segue into the last topic that I'll discuss today, which is what immunity to a virus actually looks like. I'll primarily be discussing this topic generally, but also a little bit here and there with specific reference to SARS coronavirus 2 and the ongoing pandemic. 
There have been a lot of different headlines about immunity to COVID-19 in the media. And these have, these have evolved a lot over time from discussions of immunity passports that would allow people who've been infected to return to business as usual, to concerns about quickly waning immunity and the potential for reinfection. Well, my main goal here is not to necessarily address all of these different narratives, but to leave you with a general understanding of what immunity to viruses looks like, which I think will help you to understand these different immunity-related headlines. So, as I mentioned on the previous slide, antibodies are one component of the adaptive immune system that can contribute to immunity to future infections. So, what are antibodies? Well, they're Y-shaped proteins that are produced by specialized cells within our bodies and which contain highly variable binding domains, with two of these binding domains per antibody molecule. Our bodies have the capacity to generate a huge diversity of these antibodies. And what happens during a virus infection is that cells that produce antibodies that recognize viral proteins are proliferated, increasing the concentration of these virus binding antibodies. And there are even mechanisms that allow these antibodies to mature in order to increase the affinity of the antibody for the virus. So why is it useful to produce antibodies that recognize and bind to virus proteins? Well, the primary goal is to prevent the infection of new cells by binding strongly to the virus particles in ways that prevent the virus from entering the cell and delivering its genome. What I'm showing you here is a diagram illustrating this idea. In this case, there are antibodies, which are shown here in green, which bind to proteins on the surface of the virus particle. Well, these viral proteins are critical to the virus's ability to enter a new host cell because these proteins interact directly with cellular proteins on the cell surface. We call these receptors. And this interaction is required to trigger fusion of the viral and cellular membranes. If these antibodies are able to block this interaction, then they can prevent new infections. And these types of antibodies that successfully block new infections are called neutralizing antibodies. Now, some of the headlines about COVID-19 immunity talk about studies that have reported that the abundance of antibodies that recognize SARS coronavirus 2 quickly decline following infection. And the implication has been that this may mean that people will not have long-lasting immunity to reinfection. Well, the truth is that it's going to take time for us to really understand how common it will be for people to obtain long-term immunity from these natural infections. However, there are several reasons why this observation alone is not particularly informative regarding the length of immunity. The first is that antibodies that are generated in response to viral infections are not expected to be maintained long-term at the same abundance at which they're detected shortly after infection. The figure here shows a pretty typical plot of the relative abundance of antiviral antibodies in the blood following infection. The green line here shows total antibody abundance, and the red and the blue lines break things down into individual isotypes. As you can see, there is a sharp increase, in this case starting about one week after infection, but this is followed by a plateau and then a decrease in abundance, which generally levels off at some lower plateau. This pattern is completely expected, and the studies that prompted those new headlines had not observed patients for long enough to see where antibody abundance would eventually level off. However, even if these antibodies were to decline to extremely low levels, it doesn't mean that immune response would be starting from scratch the next time an individual is exposed to the same virus. This is because long-lived memory B cells will remain, and these cells are capable of quickly generating large amounts of highly specific antibodies 
as soon as they encounter the same viral proteins again. Therefore, even if the standing stock of antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2 is low, upon reinfection, these antibodies will be able to be generated much more quickly than during that initial infection. And these antibodies will likely also be even better at binding to the virus than those that were generated early during the primary infection. And this is illustrated here on the right by adding an example of a secondary response to infection within the same diagram that I showed you on the previous slide. In this case, antibodies are generated faster and the response is even stronger than it was to the primary infection. And finally, antibodies represent just one arm of our adaptive immune response. The other arm is mediated by immune cells called T cells. And while antibodies are important for preventing the infection of new cells, T cells play a critical role in clearing viral infections by seeking out and destroying cells with active viral infections. And antibody levels are not able to tell us anything about the T cell mediated response, which will also be long lasting. All right, this is my final slide, and I just wanted to end by discussing a recent report that documented the first confirmed case of reinfection with SARS coronavirus 2 in humans. There have been anecdotal stories of similar reinfections before, but this is the first to be clearly demonstrated because they were able to actually sequence the genome of the virus from both infections, and they were able to show that they both infections were caused by distinct strains. However, while this individual experienced minor symptoms associated with the first infection, which occurred in March, he experienced no symptoms in association with the second infection, which occurred in August. The good news here is that although his first exposure was not able to completely protect him from reinfection, it was able to protect him from disease. And it remains to be seen how common these reinfections will be, and perhaps more importantly, whether these reinfected individuals will be able to spread the virus to novel hosts. Please keep in mind that this virus is still very new for us. At this point, it's only been causing human infections still for less than a year. And so we're continuing to learn new things every day about the virus and how it spreads. But I hope that this talk has helped to provide you with a foundation of knowledge about this virus and will help you to interpret the next big headlines to come.